So I am really going, um, this talk is really just to be a very kind of simple intro um, to CGD and then the rest of our speakers throughout the session um, are really going to build upon that going into a lot more detail about specific manifestations of CGD um, and treatment modalities and things like that. So if you're not getting that from me, it will come, I promise, um, and you'll be able to see that in future talks. So a couple disclosures. Um, and then, so I always like to start um, talks on CGD with um, this slide, and this is the first um, report of CGD by um, Dr. Good's group in Minnesota. This was a paper from the 1950s that um, was detailing a young boy who ended up having diagnosis of CGD, but it's interesting that it used to be called fatal granulomatous disease of childhood. And so I like to point out just how far we've come in the last 60 or 70 years, that this is no longer um, a fatal disease of childhood, that um, children and even adults are living well into adulthood um, with medical management or other options for therapy. So this is um, not intended to be a super complicated slide, although it kind of looks like this. And this is really just to show the mechanism of uh, CGD. So you can see, I don't know, do we have a pointer or no? I can use my mouse. Oh. Dr. Malik has one. Thank you. The top? Perfect. Okay. So you guys can see this complex right here. Sorry, I'm not very good with the pointer. Is a is the NADPH complex. And those that complex is made of six different proteins, five of which we're going to really um, uh, concentrate on today, and mutations in any of those proteins give you the same disease or give you CGD. Um, the most common um, is uh, defects in this protein, GP91FOX, that cause X-linked CGD, or the most common one that's found in little boys. And then the rest of those are uh, inherited in different different means. So when this complex comes together um, within the cell, it leads to the production of superoxide or um, oxygen radicals. And those um, molecules are really intended and, and responsible for killing certain bacteria and fungi. And so when this process goes wrong, patients get infections with certain bacteria and fungi. So this is just showing that. So how do patients with CGD present? So they can present really any way they want, but the most common ways that they present typically are recurrent infections or really even a single infection with an unusual organism that um, those infections often are um, life-threatening or sometimes can be life-threatening or very deep infections, meaning in, in organs of the body, so potentially like a liver infection or a bone infection, even bloodborne infections. Uh, children often have failure to thrive, so they're not gaining weight or even height like their counterparts. Um, uh, patients can present with inflammatory bowel disease. Um, it's a common manifestation in CGD that Dr. Zerbe is going to be talking to us about later, um, but patients could, that can be their presenting symptom as well. Poor wound healing is another common um, feature, even presentation of CGD. Uh, granuloma formation, so developing granulomas in different areas of the body, um, again, associated with CGD, but can be a uh, presenting symptom. And then granulomas that lead to obstruction of different um, organs uh, in the body can be a presenting symptom. A common one uh, that we see in children is um, gastric outlet obstruction, or where the, where the stomach empties into the intestine is obstructed by a granuloma, and that can lead to really severe failure to thrive and profuse vomiting in um, young children, and so that's a common obstructive granuloma. So the diagnosis of CGD, so it, um, the frequency as far as we know it now, at least in North America, is some, somewhere around 1 in 100,000 to 1 in 200,000. Um, and the presentation is usually in childhood, um, but there are a lot more adult cases that are recognized, and I think that's just a testament to, um, I hope, us as physicians for recognizing it, but also patients that are living longer with this disease and sometimes going uh, undiagnosed. So just to explain a little bit of the inheritance pattern um, as we show the different types of CGD. So X-linked inheritance, um, so X-linked CGD is the most common form of CGD. And you can see, as it's pointed out on this uh, slide, the father of the child is typically unaffected. And this is, there are certainly outliers to all of this, but this is the most common. The mother is typically a carrier for CGD, so she carries um, the abnormal gene. And then you can see that mo the mom's sons um, 
have a 50% chance of being affected. They have a 50% chance of not being affected as well. And then the, the daughters of that mother and father um, also have a 50% chance of being a carrier. So that's X-linked inheritance pattern. Recessive is very different from that in that uh, each parent is carrying the abnormal gene. And so every child, no matter the sex of the child, has a 25% chance of being affected, of inheriting both abnormal genes from the parents. Um, and so you can see that in this diagram below, that the affected child that's you know one out of um, four has a chance. And then um, there is a 50% chance of a child being a carrier for either of the genes from each parent. And so potentially that might matter if they meet another person and have children with another person who's a carrier as the sequence goes, goes on. So if we look at types of CGD, X-linked, like I've said, is the most common. Um, and then there are women who are typically female carriers. There are a lot of cases of X-linked CGD where, where women are not the carriers. So it doesn't necessarily, if a, if a boy has X-linked CGD, we certainly want to look at their mothers and sisters, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean 100% that they are a carrier. And then the recessive CGD, so uh, P47 FOX deficiency is the most t common type of recessive CGD. And about, because of the genetics of this disease, about 1 in 250 people in the general population our carrier for, for a specific type of mutation in P47 FOX. So how do we diagnose CGD? So many of you in the audience and uh, may have, have, have had this test performed on your children or yourselves looking for CGD. And you can see uh, basically the, just the premise of how this test is run is cells are taken um, out of the body in blood and are exposed to a dye. Um, and to a stimulant. And when that stimulant, um, when those neutrophils uh, get stimulated and produce superoxide, um, they change color. And so you can see in the middle picture that's what's happening, that the, the neutrophils have changed a color. You can see in CGD patients, at least in this example, there is no color change because there's presumably no superoxide being made or that ra um, oxygen radicals that I showed you. And you can see in a, in a carrier, in a woman, they have two populations. They have the, the, the neutrophils that are changing color, and then you have the ones that are not. And so the reason we tend not to use this test anymore is because it's very subjective. It relies on somebody looking at it with their eyeballs, and they, in humans, make error. And so there have been cases where women are told that, no, in fact, you're not a carrier, and then go on to have a boy with CGD. And so that is not something we want to do. Um, but it is still a good test and is still available um, and can be done. So um, it's not perfect, but it's still available. So the way we do this now is we use something called the dihydrorhodamine. So I'm going to skip just to showing kind of the results. So the dihydrorhodamine assay is very similar to the nitro blue tetrazoleum test, except it's not relying on a, on a human. It's relying on a machine to, uh, for an output. And so you're taking neutrophils, you're exposing them to that dye again, you're exposing them to that stimulant, and you're looking for fluorescence of the cells as they make that superoxide. And so you can see in the normal um, um, person without CGD, they have this nice peak as the superoxide is being produced, the cells are fluorescing, the machine detects that. In a, in a CGD patient or X-linked CGD, you don't have uh, that movement of that peak, which indicates that there's not superoxide being made. In recessive patients, you have often a little bit of a peak because it's not an all or none phenomenon. They might make some superoxide. And in the X-linked carriers, you have that, those two populations, just like you do with the nitro blue tetrazoleum. So what's nice about this test is it's, it's much more quantitative. It doesn't rely on a human being, you know, reading a slide. And it can sometimes tell you a little bit about the genetics. So when we diagnose patients, we look at these pictures and we're able to give some, pro, you know, information about what we think might be going on genetically. Okay, so a little bit just about CGD infections. So like I mentioned, they're primarily from bacteria and fungi. Um, what's listed here are the five most common infections that we see in North America. Um, and they let, there are certain areas of the body that they like to go to. So liver, bone, lymph nodes, um, uh, sometimes the blood, uh, sometimes even the, the central nervous system like the brain, um, and uh, so forth. <clears throat> 
the granulomatous complications, so I, I mentioned those a little bit. This is this picture on the right is an example of gastric outlet obstruction. So this, this giant white blob is the stomach, and um, that dye should be emptying into the intestine within that picture, and it's not. So that indicates that the outlet of the stomach is being blocked by something, and in this case, the outlet was being blocked by granuloma that was compressing that um, exit point. You can see on the left picture, this is the esophagus, where there can be granulomas that form uh, in that area that then cause the esophagus. The esophagus should look like a garden hose, very straight, kind of um, uh, going down, and you can see all these, all these strictures that are happening. This is a picture of the kidneys and the bladder. You can see right there, that's the bladder all full of dye. And what's happening is that these kidneys are getting backed up and getting big. Almost if you just think about plumbing, when, when something's supposed to be draining, when it doesn't, it gets, it gets kind of backed up and the area gets swollen. And that's what's happening here because of granulomas that have formed in the bladder. So inflammatory bowel disease in CGD, it's a very common problem occurring somewhere around 35 to 50 percent of patients. The symptoms that are present with um, inflammatory bowel disease are really um, not specific to CGD specifically, meaning that they are they cross over with patients who have inflammatory bowel <laughs> disease because of just having Crohn's disease or or other um, other problems. And so those things can include abdominal pain, nausea, growth disturbance, diarrhea, things like that. This picture on the right is just showing the location of abdominal pain, that it's kind of all over the place. It's not, again, not specific to CGD. And again, Dr. Zerbe is going to go into a lot more detail about inflammatory bowel disease and, and CGD. So how do we manage patients? Um, prophylactic antibiotics and antifungals, and then prophylactic interferon gamma. So the, the antibiotic that most of us recommend um, is trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. That's what the TMP SMX is, but that's a lot to type, so <laughs> we use the acronym. Um, but the names for that are Septra or Bactrim. And then itraconazole is the most common antifungal that's used, but other antifungals are used as well, including uh, voriconazole or posiconazole, and those are um, ones you might have heard of. And then interferon gamma is also used for the prevention of um, infections in CGD. And then there's this sort of constant aggressive search and treatment for infections. So um, patients, um, even if they are asymptomatic, um, we routinely are evaluating them just to make sure that this prophylaxis is working. Prophylaxis is exactly what it sounds like. It prevents. It doesn't 100% prevent infections, and so there are patients who will still get infections despite being on prophylaxis. Um, it certainly is reduced with prophylaxis, but not zero. And so we want to constantly be monitoring our patients um, for these things. So how do we do that? So you must follow with an immunologist or another specialist that has specialty in CGD. So immunologists aren't always available everywhere. Sometimes CGD patients are followed by infectious disease doctors or hematologists, oncologists, and that's, that's fine as well as long as they have um, uh, specialty training in the management of CGD. And so they may order tests looking for evidence of infection, and this, these are things that can be routinely done, not necessarily when a patient is sick. Um, they may want to occasionally get imaging, like a CT of the chest or anything as it pertains to specific symptoms. And treatment, if there is an infection, is typically prolonged and usually requires some sort of IV medication. So this is when a CGD patient gets pneumonia, it's very different than a person who gets pneumonia who doesn't have CGD. Um, the treatment is longer, it's more intense, um, and that's part of it. So. So expectations for the CGD patient, I, this is what I typically tell my patients, there's going to be frequent and close follow-up with, with your physician. Um, you want to take medications every day to prevent infections. You're going to need frequent labs. That might be every three months or it might be every week, depending on what's going on, um, to um, just based on the history that you're providing. And then when infections are present, you may end up needing procedures to identify what that organism is. Uh, that's causing the infection, and there may be a referral for bone marrow transplantation or other types of treatment depending on the course, and not every patient necessarily is going to have that, but depending on the history and the course of the patient. So with that, I will conclude.